Even when we're not traveling, Nikki and I are always cramped up together. In Key Largo, we live in a 33-foot long travel trailer. When we go to Barcelona, we have always stayed in these 30 square meter little studio apartments and it's tight. So unless you go to the bathroom and shut the door, you really don't have any privacy. And yet somehow we're still together and no one has died yet. Here's some advice that we're still learning sometimes. Hi, welcome to another masterclass on long-term travel. And today we're talking about couples in tight spaces. Like I mentioned earlier, we tend to live in small spaces, telling ourselves that we'll never be inside. We'll always be out exploring. And in the beginning of each trip, we tend to follow that mantra pretty closely. But everyone needs downtime and rest, even us. And sometimes, like me, you even have to work remotely, which means your tiny home becomes an office for you. And perhaps your partner still sees it as just a tiny home. Let's start with FOMO, fear of missing out. When I'm working during the day, Nikki is often out and about, exploring, hanging out with friends, things other than sitting behind a computer. And for the record, yes, she works, but my job requires more of a time-based attachment to a desk and an internet connection. So as I'm sitting, coding, and wishing I was a trust fund baby, she's doing the things I wish I was doing. This can be a real relationship test. For us, it's become sort of routine. Nikki does exploration during the day. She finds places and things. And for larger finds, she tends to hold off, knowing she'll bring me back later which gives me a little guilt knowing she's waiting, but it's an extremely nice gesture. And for the rest, well, we now have great things to talk about over tapas and our dinner. True, maybe my offerings to the conversation are going to be office politics based or things I found online, and hers will be those that great tales are made of. But in the retelling, there is joy. I can live through her memories knowing that even though she's already done something fun, it might even have been fun enough for her to do again, only with me next time. I suppose it breaks down to losing the desire for competition and realizing that together, between us, we can see and do so much, as long as we share it fully at the end of the day. There is this thing that happens even when you're not traveling, and it's the opposite of what I just spoke of. The things where only one of you are really interested in. When you travel and spend so much time together, it's easy to forget that each person is unique and has individual desires. Nikki has her thing about emergency management and volunteering. And yes, I find it interesting. And no, it's not my passion. Same with probably half a dozen other things for both she and I. When you're at home, it's, it's sometimes hard to remember that you need your own space to do your own thing. And when you travel and spend most moments within feet of each other, it's one of the first things you can forget. So don't allow the resentment to start. Remember, you can be in a tiny cell together and still be individuals. Set time where you each respect the tiny space around each other. Be okay when someone wants to go up by themselves and see or do something. It doesn't mean you're being shunned. It means you're in a human relationship. And if it's hard at home, it's doubly hard away. Just remember and give each other a little space, even when there's not a lot of space to give. Now things will go wrong. A train or a bus will be late. A flight will be overbooked. Some rules will seem to have been created to just to stymie you and send you to travel hell. And it will probably be in a country where your native language will not get you an easy resolution. So what else can you do to take your frustrations out? Well, you take it out on your partner. And, well, that's not really fair now, is it? People can be problem solvers. They can be Eeyores dwelling in the issues. Some folks can ask for help. Others have anger struggles. And some just need a good punching bag. But that missing train isn't just affecting you. Your partner's not on it either. This affects Nikki and I quite often, mostly me, 
because apparently I need to revisit this topic several times each trip. I am by nature a problem solver that never asks for help. I see an issue and pounce. Only I forget that the issue isn't mine and mine alone, and whether I fix it or not, I almost always have a secondary problem caused by my original solution. Don't be like Rick. It's hard, way hard. And remembering that an issue impacts you both isn't going to magically make it easier, but do the best you can. At least that's what I keep telling myself. When it comes to differing agendas, there's something we really don't have to deal with, but I'm going to address it anyway. When Nikki and I travel, it's almost always for a long, long time. If one wants to go to Disney World and the other Disneyland, we have time to do both. And for the record, I really wouldn't want to do either of those. This is just an example. What happens when you have just enough time for a single choice? Well, I suppose one solution would be to exchange your return plane ticket for one the next week, giving you the time to avoid the conflict. But that may not be an option. As far as how to really solve it, I've got no idea. But I do want to bring it up, because before you travel is probably the best time to address it. Not when you're in the car and arguing about left or right at the next intersection. And that does touch on something we do have to remind ourselves of often. And that's to be inclusive in planning. All too often, one of us will just book something. This is usually me. A flight, an event, something. And then tell the other person about it later. Sometimes it's no big deal. Sometimes it's even great. But when you book that flight and forget to send the other person the itinerary, someone is going to be unhappy. Same with decisions on destinations and on what you want. I guess the best word here is communicate. Then communicate again. Sleep, eat, and communicate some more. It's too easy to forget, so just don't. There, I communicated my message quite clearly. So don't get upset with me because you didn't read the email with the itinerary that I sent. I think I sent it. Travel accelerates relationships. It brings out the best and the worst. And perhaps that's the greatest lesson of all, knowing that it's going to do both. Expect it. Your travels inside of tight spaces are going to be a challenge. Find ways of making it an adventure instead. Know that it's going to cause friction and don't let it ruin an otherwise great day when it does. Just be ready to forgive and to be forgiven. Now our next apartment in Barcelona is gonna be a two bedroom, which will hopefully give us less chance for couples therapy. I know it will certainly be nicer when we have visiting guests, but still all of these thoughts that I've made in this video are still gonna be going through my head. Because yes, I'm the one that's hard to live with sometimes. It's usually because I'm trying to be a white knight and solve a problem and because I don't ask for help and we all know how that eventually goes. What I need to remember is that my knighthood is really more of a couples thing and if I can remember to be inclusive, if I can remember to communicate, well, anyway, just remember all of this is normal. Now be a pirate and go wander.